Hello, squirrels. Here I go again. This will be the second time you'd think I'd learned my lesson. I did it on the Chromebook, so here I am on the camera. I mean, my phone camera. Um... I'm going to go back and read the last sentence in chapter 17 uh, with the middle where we were. I know that Jim and Jerry are in the trenches that Ken and Walter will be soon, that if one of them does not come back, my heart will break. Yet I go on and work and plan, yes, and even enjoy life by times. There are moments when we have real fun because just for a moment. We don't think about things, and then we remember, and the remembering is worse than thinking of it all the time would have been. Today was dark <clears throat> and cloudy, and tonight is wild enough, as Gertrude says, to please any novelist in search of suitable matter for a murder or elopement. The raindrops streaming over the panes look like <clears throat> tears running down a face, and the wind is shrieking through the maple grove. This hasn't been a nice Christmas day in any way. Nan had a toothache, and Susan had red eyes and assumed a weird and gruesome flippancy of manner to deceive us into thinking she hadn't. And Jim's had a bad cold all day, and I'm afraid of croup. He has had croup twice since October. The first time I was nearly frightened to death, for father and mother were both away. Father always is away, it seems to me when any of this household gets sick, but Susan was cool as a fish and knew just what to do, and by morning, Jim's was all right. That child is a cross between a duck and an imp. He's a year and four months old, trots about everywhere, and says quite a few words. He has the cutest little way of calling me will -o -will. It always brings back that dreadful, ridiculous, delightful night when Ken came to say goodbye, and I was so furious and happy. Jim's is pink and white and big-eyed and curly-haired, and every now and then I discover a new dimple in him. I could never quite believe he's really the same creature as that scrawny, yellow, ugly little changeling I brought home in a soup tureen. <laughs> Nobody has ever heard a word from Jim Anderson. If he never comes back, I shall keep Jim's. If he, if he never comes back, I shall keep Jim's always. Everybody here worships and spoils him, or would spoil him if Morgan and I didn't stand remorselessly in the way. Susan says Jim's is the cleverest child she ever saw and can recognize old Nick when he sees him. This because Jim's threw poor Doc out of an upstairs wind the cat <laughs> out of an upstairs window one day. Doc turned into Mr. Hyde on his way down and landed in a currant bush, spitting and swearing. <laughs> I tried to console his inner cat with a saucer of milk, but he would have none of it and remained Mr. Hyde the rest of the day. Jim's latest exploit was to paint the cushion of the big armchair in the sun parlor with molasses. <laughs> oh my gosh. And before anybody found it out, Mrs. Fred Clow came in on Red Cross business and sat down on it. <laughs> her new silk dress was ruined and nobody could blame her for being vexed. But she went into one of her tempers and said nasty things and gave me such slams about spoiling gems that I nearly bowled over too, but I kept the lid on till she had waddled away, and then I exploded the fat, clumsy, hard old thing, I said. <laughs> and oh, what satisfaction it was to say it. She has three sons at the front, Mother said rebukingly. I suppose that covers all her shortcomings and manners, I retorted. But I was ashamed, for it's true that all her boys have gone, and she was very plucky and loyal about it, too. And she's a perfect tower of strength in the Red Cross. It's a little hard to remember all the heroines. Just the same, it was her second new silk dress in one year, and that, when everybody is or should be trying to save and serve... I had to bring out my green velvet hat again lately and begin wearing it. I hung it on. 
to my new blue straw sailor. No, I hung on to my blue straw sailor as long as I could. How I hate the green velvet hat. It's so elaborate and conspicuous, I don't see how I could ever have liked it. But I vowed to wear it, and wear it I will. Shirley and I went down to the station this morning to take little dog Monday a bang-up Christmas dinner. Dog Monday waits and watches there still with just as much hope and confidence as ever. Sometimes he hangs around the station house and talks to people, and the rest of the time he sits at his little kennel door and watches the track unwinkingly. We never try to coax him home now. We know it's of no use. When Jim comes back, Monday will come home with him, and if Jim never comes back, Monday will wait there for him as long as his dear dog heart goes on beating. Fred Arnold was here last night. He was 18 in November and is going to enlist just as soon as his mother is over an operation she has to have. He's been coming here very often lately, and though I like him so much, it makes me uncomfortable because I'm afraid he is thinking that perhaps I could care something for him. I can't tell him about Ken because, after all, what is there to tell? And yet I don't like to behave coldly and distantly when he will be going away so soon. It's very perplexing. I remember I used to think it would be such fun to have dozens of bows, and now I'm worried to death because two are too many. I'm learning to cook. Susan is teaching me. I tried to learn long ago, but no, let me be honest. Susan tried to teach me, which is a very different thing. I never seemed to succeed with anything, and I got discouraged. But since the boys have gone away, I wanted to be able to make cake and things for them myself, so I started it again, and this time I'm getting on surprisingly well. Susan said it's all in the way I hold my mouth, and Father says my subconscious mind is desirous of learning now, and I dare say they're both right. Anyhow, I could make dandy shortbread and fruit cake. I got ambitious last week and attempted cream puffs, but made an awful failure of them. They came out of the oven flat as flukes. I thought maybe the cream would fill them up again and make them plump, but it didn't. I think Susan was secretly pleased. She is past mistress in the art of making cream puffs, and it would break her heart if anyone else here could make them as well. I wonder if Susan Tamper, but no, I won't suspect her of such a thing. Miranda Pryor spent an afternoon here a few days ago helping me cut out certain Red Cross garments known by the charming name of vermin shirts. That's gross. Susan thinks that name is not quite decent, so I suggested she call them cootie sarks. That's, that's worse which is old Highland, Sandy's version of it, but she shook her head, and I heard her telling Mother later that, in her opinion, cooties and sarks are not proper subjects for young girls to talk about. She was especially horrified when Jim wrote in his last letter to Mother, tell Susan I had a fine cootie hunt this morning and caught 53. Ooh, lice. Susan positively turned pea green, Mrs. Dr. Dear, she said. When I was young, if decent people were so unfortunate as to get those insects, they kept it a secret if possible. I do not want to be narrow-minded, Mrs. Dr. Dear, but I still think it's better not to mention such things. Ugh, grosses me out. Cockroaches and lice. Ugh. Miranda grew confidential over our vermin shirts and told me all her troubles. She's desperately unhappy. She's engaged to Joe Milgrave, and Joe joined up in October and has been training in Charlottetown ever since. Her father was, was furious when he joined and forbade Miranda ever to have any dealing or communication with him again. Poor Joe expects to go overseas any day and wants Miranda to marry him before he goes, which shows that there have been communications in spite of Whiskers on the Moon. 
Miranda wants to marry him but cannot, and she declares it will break her heart. Why don't you run away and marry him, I said. It doesn't go against my conscience in the least to give her such advice. Joe Milgrave is a splendid fellow, and Mr. Pryor fairly beamed on him until the war broke out. And I know Mr. Pryor would forgive Miranda very, very quickly once it was over, and he wanted his housekeeper back, but Miranda shook her silvery head dolefully. Joe wants me to, but I can't. Mother's last words to me as she lay on her di <clears throat> her dying bed were, Never, never run away, Miranda, and I promised. Miranda's mother died two years ago, and it seems, according to Miranda, that her mother and father actually ran away to be married themselves. To picture Whiskers on the Moon as the hero of an elopement is beyond my power. But such was the case, and Mrs. Pryor at least lived to repent it. She had a hard life of it with Mr. Pryor, and she thought it was a punishment on her for running away. So she made Miranda promise she would never, for any reason whatever, do it. Of course, you cannot urge a girl to break a promise made to a dying mother, so I did not see what Miranda could do unless she got Joe to come to the house when her father was away and marry her there. But Miranda said that couldn't be managed. Her father seemed to suspect she might be up to something of the sort, and he never went away for long at a time, and of course Joe couldn't get leave of absence at an hour's notice. So I shall just have to let Joe go, and he will be killed. I know he'll be killed, and my heart will break, said Miranda tears running down and copiously bedewing the vermin shirts. I am not writing like this for lack of any real sympathy with poor Miranda. I've just got into the habit of giving things a comical twist if I can when I'm writing to Jim and Walter and Ken to make them laugh. I really felt sorry for Miranda, who is as much in love with Joe as a China blue girl can be with anyone, and who is dreadfully ashamed of her father's pro-German sentiments. I think she understood that I did, for she said she wanted to tell me all about her worries, because I had grown so sympathetic this past year. I wonder if I have. I know I used to be a selfish, thoughtless creature. How selfish and thoughtless. I'm ashamed to remember now, so I can't be quite so bad as I was. I wish I could help, Miranda. It would be very romantic to contrive a war wedding, and I should dearly love to get the better of Whiskers on the Moon. But at present, the Oracle has not spoken. And that's it for Chapter 17. Hopefully tomorrow we'll read chapter 18 called A War Wedding. So I hope it's Miranda and Joe. And we have tea at three in just an hour and a half or so. See you there. Be sweet. Don't be ugly. Love you. Bye-bye.